Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to take a look at the history of television news and why it is the way it is. My guest today is Dr. Charles Ponce de Leon. Dr. Ponce de Leon is a professor of history and American studies. Welcome Charles and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Well before we start on this uh, conversation we should uh, show the audience your book which is called The Way It Is, A History of Television News in America. And for those of us that have been around a while we know where that phrase comes from, The Way It Is. That uh, was the tagline that uh, Walter Cronkite used at the end of each of his CBS Evening News broadcasts throughout the 60s and 70s. And uh, truth be told, most Americans, if they watched that newscast, probably at the end of the show, unless they were especially cynical, probably agreed that, well, that probably is the way it was. So that is sort of the essence of the book, is how America and American attitudes about news and news journalism were shaped in many ways by television in that period. But you came to some interesting conclusions about television news in your book. Uh, what were some of those conclusions? Well, um, I mean, first of all, I, I was inspired to write the book because I uh, uncovered or found, they were there, readily available, some, some uh, evidence that, that showed that the conventional story uh, that we have, that television news uh, had this wonderful golden age and then degenerated into infotainment, well, I, I, I came across things that suggested that the story was a little more complicated. And so that's what led me to uh, to research and write the book, and in the course of doing so, I came to a rather different conclusion that television news, in fact, uh, changed, but it changed uh, in in ways that are not a steep descent uh, into into dreck and triviality. That in fact, the story was a lot more complicated, and even during its supposed golden age. Uh, there were forces and there were pressures and there were factors that uh, led television journalists to feel like they were making compromises and, and forced them to put on things that they wouldn't have otherwise done. And you mentioned that uh, television was television and television news were always kind of what you called an awkward fit. What did you mean by an awkward fit? Yeah, well, you know, um, the real problem that journalists who decided to work in television had is that um, most Americans from the beginning of television in the 1940s regarded television as an entertainment medium. And so uh, it, it wasn't like a newspaper. I mean, people had looked to newspapers for entertainment too, but people principally, uh, most people uh, uh, opened a newspaper, read a newspaper to at least get some sense of what was going on and get news. But television, because it began as an entertainment medium and there were very few factors that sort of led it in a different path, uh, it, it made putting on news programs uh, uh, a kind of counterpoint to the sort of dominant emphasis on entertaining people and giving them stuff that they wanted. And so, so television journalists from the start had to deal with that and had to figure out ways of, of, of producing what they regarded as quality journalism in a medium that wasn't necessarily welcoming. And as you mentioned, there were market forces that forced television to go the route of infotainment. Infotainment, of course, meaning the combination of information mixed with entertainment. Most people think of news as hard news, right. but in television we saw the advent of a, of a lot of soft news or feature stories intermixed with the hard news. And um, so with that, as you say, a descent into infotainment as opposed to just hard news, why was that necessary? Uh, well, for a number of years, the networks that produced television news programs, especially the nightly newscasts, the ones for which Walter Cronkite was famous, uh, were under very few pressures in terms of providing audiences with what audiences wanted. So in other words, they were uh, protected. Uh, and could really uh, be themselves the judges of what stories should go on the air and how those stories should be treated. And, uh, and, it, and, and it was a position of privilege and, they, and, 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 and for reasons largely having to do with their prestige uh, within the larger television network as well as uh, a need to uh, 
uh, provide uh, the public with some public interest programming, which was required by the FCC. I mean, they, they enjoyed that privileged position. And then, uh, but, but over time, uh, well, uh, well, let me add, and this is crucial, that's never what most viewers ever wanted. And so they were allowed to produce a kind of news that consumers didn't want, but were forced to watch because there really were no other things on TV at the time. Very few other competing channels in most markets, three or four stations max, three of those, the three networks airing news at exactly the same time. And so, so uh, they, could, they could ignore the wishes of the public. And what the public wished for was a lot more variety, hard news, soft news, features, infotainment. And so, so uh, as uh, the networks experienced more and more competition from uh, non-network independent stations, especially those that were on the UHF band, uh, from cable, uh, they were compelled to uh, begin to cater to the uh, preferences of viewers and what viewers wanted for better or worse, was uh, uh, forms of, of infotainment. And, and you refer to the fragmentation of the market in television news, and we'll get into that more a little bit later in terms of what cable news did and how counter-programming affected the television news market and all of those issues. So we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. But first, let's go down the trail of, of history here. And we know that um, actually television news, if we want to really go back to the beginning, it starts with radio. And as far as electronic news is concerned, radio was the first and um, most compelling uh, electronic medium with news. And why was that so? Why was radio uniquely positioned to bring um, listeners news of the world? Uh, I mean, by virtue of the fact that they could, I mean, radio could provide it uh, quickly. In a, in a timely fashion, and in some instances, once technology had improved, instantaneously. Uh, I mean, those, those uh, uh, you know, reports that Edward R. Murrow and others filed during World War II from European capitals that w were made possible uh, you know, by, by phone and uh, you know, phone transmission and radio transmission, that th those, those were compelling because rather than reading something, uh, uh, about events that maybe happened the day before, you know, you were actually listening to Murrow report on what was occurring uh, wherever wherever he or his comrades were stationed. So it was the it was the timeliness and it was the the immediacy. And of course, when television came around, and especially once uh, technology improved, so that so that television could provide those kinds of live reports that. The timeliness of knowing exactly what was happening very quickly after it happened, as well as the immediacy, was even more enhanced because there was an added visual dimension. So it was here and now, and also hear it now, yes, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. And then as television came along, television then provided radio with pictures. Yeah. And uh, Edward R. Murrow then had a program called See It Now. Not just hear it now, but see it now. Yeah. And so that was one of the first innovations of television. And uh, television had trouble competing with radio in terms of the ability to bring that news forward with the pictures that were appropriate. And so radio was still the first source of news if people really wanted to hear something that was right, um, you know, cutting edge and so forth. But television did come along with technology innovations and the evolution of technology. And in the 1960s, we saw this shift to where television was really where the action was, if you will. And I think the political conventions had a lot to do with that. The technology was available for right. uh, the networks to cover the political conventions. And then the turbulence of the 1960s with the Vietnam War, first coverage of the war itself, and then the protest movements related to it, the civil rights movements, um, and the moon landings. So if we look at the 1960s, um, the, the way people perceived the evening news also changed. And, and what happened with that change in perception? Well, I mean, first off is what you mentioned earlier, where more and more people turned to news because they could, by the 60s, get timely information in this very powerful uh, visual way. Uh, and, and, and I mean, there's an ease of consumption. Uh, and there's a certain, um, th 
there's a certain fascination that people had, understandably, after reading about things to actually see them occurring or, 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 or at least see a reporter in a place where something big had just occurred. Uh, but at the same time, um, and in some respects, for the same reasons, uh, many people came to distrust uh, television news. And, and, and the reason for that is, is complicated. I mean, uh, the most important is that the television, once television networks acquired the technology to really report on the news, and once they were given half an hour rather than 15 minutes, which was the time of the original, the length of the original evening newscast, you know, they, they ventured off into directions that were not appreciated by some viewers. In other words, uh, in their efforts to provide a more comprehensive and a more accurate uh, account of what was going on, uh, some viewers were unhappy. They would have preferred not to know about that or not see it in the ways that they did. I mean, there was something visually powerful, for example, about the visual images of urban unrest in the 60s. And it's one thing to read about it, and it's quite another to see it, and it was the, and it was the power of those images and, their pow and the power to unsettle that led many people, not so much to distrust television news, but to not be very keen about watching it and be, be wary and, 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 and become skeptical when all this seemingly bad news came over the air and invaded their, their living rooms. So in a, in a sense, television news sort of became known as unwittingly um, adding to the polarization that may have been occurring in the country at that time. Despite desperately trying not to. I mean, the thing about television news that many people misunderstand is that it uh, is not and has never been a liberal institution. There is no such thing called the liberal media, at least mass media. It's, it was fundamentally a centrist media, and it was always trying to cover uh, uh, subjects and stories and developments in ways that were balanced, and balanced between what the networks and what professional journalists regarded as reasonable opinion. In other words, uh, communists would not be part of that, nor would the John Birch Society, nor or or on the other uh, or, or or Nazis. So so there was a uh, there was a great interest in, in 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 balance in objectivity, but within what they regarded as uh, uh, the the poles of of legitimate opinion. Uh, and so th they struggled desperately not to seem biased, but of course, for a variety of reasons, having nothing to do with television news or, or, or professional journalists, the country became polarized so that increasing numbers of people uh, viewed those assumptions as uh, uh, undemocratic and, uh, and very authoritarian and, and as a result came to criticize the media from both the right and the left. And so it's the consensus that the television network sought to appeal to and help to construct that, that collapsed and all of a sudden made the networks and their journalists vulnerable to accusations of being, of being biased. And on that note, we're going to have to go to the break right now. When we come back from the break, we're going to examine what many perceive to be the zenith of television broadcast news in the 1970s. Stay with us. Make a difference in someone's life. With the ever-increasing amount of senior citizens in the United States, the need for counselors, caregivers, advocates, and product developers continues to rise. Be there for someone and see how rewarding it can be. You can become part of this exciting field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Hello and welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly. My guest today is Dr. Charles Ponce de Leon. Um, Charles, when we went to the break, we were talking about the turbulence of the 60s and how that led to some to perceive news as biased in one way or another. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that and the perception of bias and how market fragmentation affected that later after the competition from cable. But before we went to the break, I also teased that we're going to talk about the 1970s, which many believe was the zenith or the high point of network television news. And by network television news, of course, I mean NBC, ABC, CBS. And the reason for that was after the Vietnam War ended and after the Watergate hearings concluded, there was that period in the mid-70s where uh, network nightly news really had no competition for a while. 
they had large uh, budgets, all of them, all the networks. They were very competitive. They were paying high salaries for their anchors. We had people like Walter Cronkite, Harry Reasoner, Barbara Walters, John Chancellor, folks that have been around a while remember those names. Um, and they also had news bureaus around the world. And so life was good in those days. But things were about to change. What happened? Well, they, uh, what was good was the, the resources, uh, you know, to, and, and, and to have the technology to be able to, at least in theory, provide uh, breaking news and, 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 and have a hope of having the network cut into regular programming if something big happened. What was not so good is that all of those resources were focused pretty much on one program, and those were the nightly newscasts. By the 1970s, I mean, the networks had pretty much given up documentaries. They still aired from time to time, but in general, uh, uh, so, so you had all these bureaus, you had all these high-priced uh, uh, anchors and correspondents, you had all this technology, you know, advanced technology, all focused on one program that had a good audience, but, but not the audience it even had in the 60s. And the reason for that is by the middle of the 70s, um, there, was, there was now more competition. Uh, one reason for that is improvements in television technology and improvements in the reception of UHF stations, which are the ones 13 and above in the old, in the old system of broadcast TV, which all of a sudden looked better than they ever had. And if people went and got cable, as more and more were doing, all of a sudden there was no discernible difference between uh, uh, a, a VHF network affiliate and, uh, and a UHF station. So all, and so many entrepreneurs began buying uh, 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 UHF stations, securing licenses from the FCC, and programming them. And, and sometimes all they could afford to program were reruns. But lo and behold, it turned out that at 6.30, there were many people who would rather watch a rerun of a program that had aired in the early 60s or late 50s than watch Walter Cronkite or, or his competitors on the networks. And so gradually, uh, either at, uh, from, from UHF competitors or from nascent cable competitors like Ted Turner's uh, Superstation based in Atlanta, more and more Americans began uh, uh, turning the channel away from network news and watching something else instead. So that by uh, the mid-70s, the, the share of all television households in America watching with, their, with the sets on in the mid-70s, 75% were watching network news. Uh, in the mid-60s, that was 90%. You know, so already, already the numbers have gone down. And by the 1980s, that number would plummet because more and more cable stations were established. All of a sudden, consumers had more and more options about what to watch. And they voted with their feet, which is something they probably would have done long ago if there had been options. But the point is, there weren't. Well, so <clears throat> television news, the broadcast uh, nightly news programs then had to suffer from essentially a, what was a one-two punch from cable and these other stations that you're talking about. The, yeah. the first punch was the counter-programming, right. where you could watch reruns of Star Trek instead of watching uh, uh, Walter Cronkite yep. uh, or John Chancellor. And then the second punch was when Ted Turner decided to develop the cable news network. Yeah. What happened then? Yeah, well, it's so, so all of a sudden, well, it actually happened sooner because uh, people who wanted a more serious, sophisticated treatment of the news would often watch the McNeil Lair you know, news report on PBS. Uh, others uh, in the uh, uh, late 70s, early 80s uh, flocked to Nightline with uh, on ABC with with Ted Koppel and then, and then and then Ted Turner and CNN. So so what what occurred were competitors that were better at doing television news than a half hour network news program, uh, and 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 more convenient too. Many people found it with the, the the realities of their life and busy schedules. It was easier to watch Nightline at 11:30 than it was to get home in time to watch a 6:30. Uh, uh, newscast. Moreover, they found that the treatment of things was more sophisticated on Nightline or on McNeil Lair, which also aired after and was designed specifically to counter program to air after the network newscast and provide a kind of gloss on a significant story or stories that, w that, that had been covered but not in the detail that some viewers wished for. And then there was also uh, 
the, if you want to call it that, the encroachment into network news by their local affiliates. Yeah. The networks had a number of local affiliates in the larger cities that were being quite innovative in those days with developing new kinds of ways of delivering the news and connecting more with the viewers directly. And one of those uh, strategies was called News You Can Use. What was News You Can Use and how did that develop? Yeah, well, that was, that was uh, feature-oriented news that was particularly keyed to the interests of people as consumers, for example, health news, uh, you know, news about uh, uh, businesses that were scamming people, you know, where they would set up hotlines where you could call up and complain about it and then someone would do an expose. But uh, uh, local news was maybe the most important competitor of all because uh, PBS, Nightline on ABC, uh, CNN, I mean those were pretty much for news junkies, people who maybe still also read a newspaper and were really interested in following the news. Uh, local newscasts developed a particular kind of, of, of program that appealed to people who were really not that interested in news, but it actually kept their interest and, and, and was designed to appeal to, to interests that were different from those of the, of the serious consumer of, of hard news. And, and, and those programs originated in the 60s, and they, and they originated when uh, local stations were looking for ways to uh, uh, better the competition and boost the, uh, uh, revenues from local advertisers. And uh, the FCC in the early 60s required uh, these stations to conduct surveys to see what their um, viewers thought of them and their programming and one of the res and, and network programming. And one of the one of the revelations from the survey is that huge majorities of viewers did not like network news. And and and. Uh, with the with the assistance of some savvy consultants, uh, local newscasters perceived a gap in the market, and so they developed local news programs that aired before the local news, that were very different and provided the soft news, the features, the more engaging, consumer-oriented and health-oriented things that people were more interested in. And then, when they when they developed uh, their own. Uh, staff and and their own uh, uh, access to technologies. They uh, they even began reporting on national international news and sending their own people, popular local people, local reporters, people that the audience could identify with, sending them uh, to Vietnam, sending them to to you know to the Middle East, uh, and so that it became possible by the mid 70s to watch a local newscast and get not only local news, which is why people originally tuned in, but national international news, at least to a degree that satisfied most people. And so now broadcast news, network broadcast news, the 6 o'clock or 5.30 or 6.30 newscast that we see on television with the main networks, main broadcast networks, they're dealing with the competition from cable. They're dealing with the competition from their own local affiliates. They're dealing with Nightline, which comes on 11.30, as you mentioned. And there's also the morning news uh, broadcast, such as Today Show, which is really infotainment, and Good Morning America, where there's a heavy mix of uh, the entertainment in with the news. But um, there, does per there did persist uh, this notion of bias uh, in the media. We talked about it a little bit before the break. And some folks have suggested that the news media is biased and slanted to the left, uh, has a liberal bias, the, the main networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, and even CNN. And as a result of that, Fox News was developed on cable as uh, basically a vehicle for people that identified with the right to have a home on cable. What about that and that notion of bias? Is there anything to it? And what about the splintering or fragmenting of the market? Well, they, the, the original complaints made against the networks were made in part because conservatives were a minority in the Republican Party and had been disempowered and marginalized by the Republican, the moderate Republican establishment. And so their voices, they felt their voices weren't, weren't heard. Uh, that, that argument gained more credence when the networks tried to cover uh, very controversial subjects like civil rights in Vietnam in an objective way in which they provided uh, uh, opportunities 
to both sides, including conservatives, but also including radicals. And so, and so when all of a sudden uh, the kinds of people who'd never spoken on the news before as sources, you know, you interview Huey Newton, for example, or Angela Davis, all of a sudden their voices are on TV. It was very easy for, for conservatives to conclude that, that the media uh, was, was biased. Now, of course, what they didn't uh, acknowledge was the fact their own spokesmen were, if anything, even more uh, uh, visible as sources as were those of their of their ideological opponents. So it was ironically the effort to be to cover things more comprehensively and to provide at least some uh, voices that had been outside of the mainstream with access that sparked charges that the that the media were biased. The the other thing that's important to note is that for many years, especially when it came to foreign policy, and Vietnam was the prime example. The major networks had been rather cozy with the federal government and with, and, and especially with uh, U.S. foreign policy, and hadn't criticized it, and then felt burned and uh, having been betrayed when it turned out that the the military and the government were lying about Vietnam. And so there was a period in the in the early 70s, in particular, when the networks finally tried to be truly an independent fourth estate and, and, and be truly an independent press. My last question is, um, you mentioned, or actually you, you uh, described your last chapter in the book as fade to black. In 15 seconds or less, what was fade to black in that context? Uh, people don't watch news on television anymore and they get their news from the internet and news will gradually, uh, if not quickly, uh, stop being something that television offers. That's a rather ominous note, but on that note, we have to bring this to a close. Unfortunately, the clock is uh, never on our side. But thank you for being here today. Sure. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Talking Points. Join us again soon for another episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day. <laughs>